Hello everyone, my name is Protesilaos, also known as Prot. In this video I will talk to you about social media. I will provide a philosophical slash personal take on the matter. Sometimes I get emails from people who ask me, hey Prot, why aren't you on social media? And they will assume the reason is because I disagree with the ownership model or perhaps with the owners of those platforms. Or maybe because my political views are not aligned with those that find currency uh, on those platforms. And while those are valid, interesting reasons, they are not my reasons. And these uh, people who will email me will suggest alternatives. And they will be like, hey, there is this Fediverse and it's federated and it's decentralized and it's very nice. And here is Mastodon and good luck with it. I will comment on the Fediverse uh, as well, but uh, first let's start with two personal experiences which for me were enlightening. They provided insight into uh, what was wrong uh, from my perspective with my usage of social media and how it was actively harming me. The year is 2012. At the time, I had a Facebook uh, account and I had a personal profile for uh, me and my friends and my family uh, members. And I also had a page, what uh, Facebook calls a page. And the difference between a page and a personal profile is that the page is open to the public. Anybody can follow the publications of the page. Whereas uh, for the profile, the personal profile, they have to be a friend of yours if you have the relevant settings enabled. Uh, so I had a page for my website. So there was me with my name and everything as a private person and me with my name again as the website. I have a, a website that I created in 2011, protesilaos.com. And I have been publishing there ever since. And if you check uh, my website, you will see that I actually publish a lot. At the time, I was writing about political affairs. I was commenting on European Union politics. And uh, one day I wrote this lengthy article. Maybe it was like 4,000 words. And me, I don't do clickbait. I don't like that practice. So my titles are generic. They are just descriptive. So I write this generic title and then there is this wall of text, 4,000 words, and I post a link to my uh, Facebook page, just the link, nothing else. And then it produces the title and basically the people have to click to read the whole thing. And uh, within seconds, maybe less than a minute, I get a few likes and uh, some comments and the comments were along the lines of approval. They were like, uh, good read, thanks for sharing, something like that. Or good read, keep it up, you know, that sort of thing. And usually what would happen is that I would be flattered by that kind of feedback. I would be like, oh, look, I write stuff in this uh, niche uh, subject and there are actually people who care about it. And they are even uh, happy to tell me that they care about it and that I am doing a good job. But this time I was uh, skeptical. I was like, this is not real, mate. Come on. You cannot possibly uh, comment nice read on something that is 4,000 words and you spent less than a minute uh, reading it. This is not possible. So I was like, mm, this is not good feedback. This is not actually valuable feedback that I get. It appears positive, but is it actually positive? Is this actually me doing something right? Is this actually people uh, reviewing my opinions or my insights and uh, concluding that they are valid? In other words, is the validation that I am receiving validation that leads me down the right path, or is it misleading? And for me, the conclusion was that this is misleading. It has to be misleading because those people didn't actually engage with the material. Now, there may be a variety of reasons why people behave this way or 
did that uh, sort of uh, thing. Uh, and it wasn't an isolated dissident, but it was when I started uh, observing. Uh, so there may be many reasons. Maybe they want to show their political uh, allegiance. Maybe they want to show that they know who I am. Maybe they want to show that uh, they are smart and they read this obscure kind of uh, stuff, these obscure articles or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what uh, kind of motivation people have, and it doesn't matter. What matters for me is that this kind of shadow play, this kind of uh, just virtue signaling, this kind of feedback that you cannot make anything out of, is misleading. Because it doesn't tell me if I am doing the right thing or the wrong thing, but it gives me the impression that I am doing the right thing. One second, because my dog is there. Ah, okay, he's just chewing on some grass, so that's fine. So that I am doing the right thing. So after I noticed that, I was really skeptical of any kind of feedback from uh, my Facebook page. So when I would publish something that wouldn't get as many likes or comments, I wouldn't uh, feel bad about it. Because before, I would feel bad about it. And I was like, huh, this thing I wrote didn't ke- get any reaction, so probably I said something stupid, I need to do better, or uh, maybe people don't care about this, or they don't like me, or whatever. You know, all these negative thoughts. But then, after I understood that the positive feedback was not actually valuable feedback and was not genuinely positive, I applied the same thinking to the negative feedback. And I was like, well, this isn't negative either. The fact that I didn't get a response doesn't mean that I am wrong per se. Maybe I am, but that remains to be determined. The fact that I didn't receive feedback doesn't tell me anything in and of itself. So I stopped paying attention to it. And I stopped having an emotional response, be it positive or negative, uh, towards it. Once I understood that it is just a shadow play. It's just a little game that people play on the platform. And then, of course, uh, you can consider how the algorithms work and uh, what they will suggest to people. And you can consider how people will be scrolling uh, past their feed and just basically checking the stuff that they think they like and dismissing the stuff they don't like. So all these combine into an appreciation of the fact that Facebook, the Facebook page, doesn't do anything for me as a content creator. So eventually I delete the Facebook page. I also had a Twitter account, and on Twitter, it was a similar experience. I would uh, post a tweet with uh, with a link to my article, and uh, people would just uh, read it and take it from there. This was the idea. And I started observing the same patterns over there, where people would uh, retweet, and then they would uh, comment below it or whatever, And it was, again, the same kind of behavior where it was actually meaningless interaction. So I eventually decided that this is not good for me because it messes up with my emotional state. It engenders some kind of behavioral patterns where I try to anticipate what people will like. So I will write that. And then I will get positive feedback and this will be good validation for me. So I will keep writing that and I will keep feeling well because of the feedback I receive. And I was like, hold on a second. Will I be speaking my mind or will I be playing this game of a feedback loop of the echo chamber, basically? Of me saying something that everybody says so that we pat each other on the back. So I stopped paying attention to that either. This was the first experience that was enlightening. The idea that the feedback shouldn't elicit an emotional response. I should maintain a a distance from it. The other experience was, I think maybe a year later, I was already not a a fan of uh, social media, but I was still using them. I was uh, using them on the premise that 
uh, I have uh, friends and uh, family and relatives, all that, and uh, we need to be connected. And on Twitter, I have these interesting people that follow, whatever. So I was rationalizing why I absolutely need those accounts. But I was no longer emotionally invested in the feedback uh, of my, for my article. Then there was this case. I was with a friend of mine. We were in Brussels and we were sitting at the city square. And uh, it was the turn uh, for my friend to pay for uh, Belgian style fries. If you have ever been to Brussels, you know what I am talking about. There are, however, these tourist uh, traps. So we didn't go there. We went to another place that did the traditional recipe. And uh, with my friend, we would uh, pay for each other's uh, meal uh, and we would take turns. So it was his turn uh, to uh, pay for the fries. So he went uh, and uh, um, took his uh, turn on uh, the line uh, waiting for the fries. And I was there sitting on the table. And next to me, there were other tables with people. And it was a nice day and it was a busy day. And... Uh, my dog is here and he wants attention. And so uh, what happened is that as soon as my friend left, instead of me paying attention to my immediate environment and perhaps talking to some uh, people on the other uh, tables, I pulled out the phone and I started uh, checking my social media to see what was up, you know, what uh, kind of uh, thing did I miss? What happened in the world since the last time I checked? which was probably 30 minutes uh, ago. Uh, I had this app, I think it was called the Tweetbot or something like that. And what it would do, it would show you a counter with the number of tweets you had missed since the last time you launched the app. And uh, I launched the app and it's like 300. So I am like, okay, I have to read 300 uh, tweets and see what is happening. I don't want to uh, miss anything and be out of the loop, right? So it created in me this kind of feeling that uh, I need to be on, like, this is a job kind of thing. I need to know what is happening, uh, which, of course, we know is completely pointless uh, stuff. But then when that happened, I started feeling disappointed with myself and I was angry about my behavior. Angry, not in an aggressive sense, but in a sense of you can do better. Why are you doing this? This is, uh, this is not nice. And what I, was, uh, what I told myself at the time was, hey, mate, is your life so boring, so pointless, that there is absolutely nothing to do around you? And the only escape is to just uh, uh, pull out your phone and be absorbed in this app. Can you not do something to improve your experience? Is it really that miserable? Is it really that helpless? So I had this kind of anger, this kind of deep-seated disappointment in my mindless behavior. In how I would mindlessly pull out the phone and even though I was in a social setting, I would behave as if nobody exists and I was me and the phone, me and the app. So I decided to switch it off, uh, the phone, and uh, put it back in my pocket. And I just uh, sat there and I enjoyed uh, the uh, view and I observed my environment. So I started doing that. And there was one other case, again, with my same friend. And uh, I was sitting at the table and right next to me, there was this other table with an elderly couple. And uh, my friend uh, was again, uh, his turn to pay. And uh, I was uh, alone uh, on the table and the elderly couple next to me. And we started talking and we had an exchange. An exchange which would have been impossible were I still uh, um, uh, having the same kind of behavioral patterns. So I was able to have this exchange and it was a thoughtful, a profound exchange. We talked about 
uh, everyday affairs and then eventually we switched to politics because uh, the couple thought that I had some interesting insights and then they remarked that uh, oh we need the young generation to step forth and um, assume responsibility and uh, be in the centers of power etc and our generation they said uh, should just uh, be on the sidelines we had our turn and now it's time for the youth so this was their um, point and then I commented on that and my take was more nuanced uh, and I was like well I understand that the youth bring exuberance and new ideas and they can make things happen but uh, we must not forget that experience is also valuable and uh, we cannot just uh, throw all that away and just have 20 year olds in charge we need to have uh, people of all ages uh, to have uh, the, the pluralist kind of uh, discourse that actually benefits us. Anyway, it doesn't really matter what we talked about. What matters is that this was a human moment. This was a human connection. It was me. I was like 20 something at the time and uh, this elderly couple. And we had this wonderful uh, moment together. And I really appreciated it. And I was like, this is it. This is exactly what I want to have in my life. This kind of intentional outlook where I am not doing things mindlessly. I don't just pull out the phone like a, a mindless uh, person. I can actually set a structure in my life and I can actually uh, put some order and I can actually engage with others. I can actually pay attention to my environment and understand what is happening in my milieu. And of course, this applies in the immediate sense of me sitting at a table and having a chat with uh, the next table, but it also extends to life in general. Like, you put things in order in your life as well. You have a certain structure, and you have patterns, and with discipline, you follow those uh, patterns. You are not just doing things uh, without any sense of uh, meaning. You don't just allow yourself, indulge yourself in that kind of uh, behavior. So this is when I decided to um, forego social media. This is when I decided that it doesn't work for me. It is actually harming me. It was harming me because it was giving me uh, misleading uh, signals. And it was harming me because it was inhibiting my humanity. It was not allowing me to uh, have this um, experience with my immediate world. There are other things with uh, social media, of course, which are bad, uh, but which I think stem from those two. I think they are related to what I have already described. Like on social media, you will see that there is this tendency for the extremes to be amplified. And I think, of course, there are the algorithms which do that and which are horrible. But I think there is also something to be said about how people, because they don't have this interpersonal connection, how they tend to dehumanize the other person. Like, if you are sitting on a table and you are talking to someone, let's imagine this scenario, me and the elderly couple. Like, uh, maybe we don't agree on politics. Maybe they are conservative and I am a leftist and uh, I want things to happen and they want to preserve the status quo. Maybe. But at the personal level, we get to laugh, we get to smile, we get to see each other. I cannot hate that person because we disagree on some political uh, views. But if it's some anonymous user123 on Twitter, I hate that person to their guts because I'm like, oh, you said this and you tweeted that and you follow this other person, so I hate you. And I dehumanize that person because I have no human connection to begin with, right? It could as well be a bot. I have no idea. 
And so when we don't have an emotional connection and a human connection, a face-to-face -face kind of connection, where we know the other person, we tend to just treat them as an emotionless entity. And we tend to attribute to them malice and evil. And we tend to think that, oh, everything you think is because you have a bigoted worldview or whatever. Whereas in reality, things will be more nuanced. In reality, if you get to know the person, maybe they are not as terrible as you think. Maybe you still disagree on important issues, but it's not like there is absolutely nothing you have in common. And it's the same, of course, with uh, people of different ages, people of different ethnicities, of different races, and so on. When we don't actually expose ourselves to those people and we have this virtual understanding of them, we tend to uh, make generalizations, we tend to stereotype, we tend to just treat them as this homogeneous mass. And we will say things that we wouldn't actually say to a person that we know. We wouldn't actually say, you wouldn't actually meet, let's say, a Greek guy like me and say, hey, you, I am talking to you and I got to know you and you are the same as all the other Greeks. You wouldn't say that because you would know that it is not true. Because you would have met other Greeks, you would have met me, and you would have noticed the differences and the commonalities, of course. But the point is that you would have a more nuanced understanding. It wouldn't be some extremist absurdity, which is what we tend to see on social media. And so I think that the proliferation of extreme views and of the concomitant controversies is fundamentally because of this. It's fundamentally because it's just an avatar it, it could be a bot. I have no idea. I don't care. I just hate it. Because I am not connected to it emotionally. There is no interhuman, interpersonal affair there. Whereas when we have a more intentional outlook, and when we are like, you know what, I want to experience the world around me, and I want to understand what is happening. We are brought down to earth. We are brought down to earth because we meet real people and not people who are byproducts of some algorithm and some scheme going on in a virtual world. So we meet real people and we also expose ourselves to real opinions, not the kind of extreme, silly nonsense that you will most uh, often find on social media. So in practice, you will meet people that disagree with you, but these disagreements will be mild in comparison to what you find uh, online. Furthermore, in comparison to what you have online, when you engage with people face to face, you are uh, giving them your attention and you are treating them with uh, respect. And you are also giving them the opportunity to elaborate, to explain themselves. Something that a person on uh, a social media platform doesn't have. They don't have your undivided attention. You are just scrolling by and you find this so-called drama and depending on what your inclination is, either you will approve or you will disapprove but you will be like a reactionary in the sense of just responding to it right away. And you will be like, okay, screw you, for or against, I don't know. And that's what you will do. You don't pay any attention and then you scroll to the next uh, thing for today, for the moment rather. Whereas when you keep your attention on a person and when you are interacting with someone, you will treat them more fairly. You will not dehumanize them, as we said, and you will also not uh, objectify them in uh, them being the uh, personification, the embodiment of some idea, some evil ideology, which is 
terrible and which uh, shouldn't uh, exist because uh, you disagree with it. In real life, people, when you interact with them, you see that they are much more complex and they are multidimensional and they are not this um, simplistic kind of uh, idiot that uh, you must loathe uh, throughout. So uh, for me, getting off of uh, social media was an opportunity to um, improve my habits. It was an, not an opportunity, it was rather the beginning. It was the start of me being more intentional. And I was like, you know what? I will no longer have these kind of mindless habits, mindless reactions where I just do something without thinking about it. I will do things for which I can answer why. Why are you using social media? Is the question I would ask myself. And I couldn't come up with a good answer because I knew that I wasn't getting good feedback. I knew that I wasn't making real friends. I knew that uh, the whole thing was basically superficial and just a shadow play. So why was I on that thing? And of course, you don't actually learn uh, the news or anything on social media. We know that for sure. So what, I, what was I doing there? And the answer is nothing. So why am I there? I shouldn't be. Ergo, I quit. But the deeper point is that I understood the importance of asking why. Why do you do something? What is the point of it? And if there is some good reason for it, okay, continue doing it. But if you cannot come up with a good reason, and if it's something that you do, oh, because I'm used to, or oh, because my friends do, or oh, because I think people will like me if I do, these are not good reasons. At least for me, they are not good reasons. I have to have a very good reason to do something. And this applies, of course, to life in general. I'm not talking about social media. And so by having a good reason to do something means that I will not get sidetracked and absorbed into every uh, rabbit hole that comes my way. Because whenever some opportunity arises to uh, be distracted, I will ask myself, why do you want this? Why do you need this? What is the end goal? Will you commit to this long term? Will you be there in two years, in five years? Will you still be doing that? Why? So by having this kind of rigor, as it were, this kind of scrutiny in our actions, help us understand the essential uh, things and uh, let go of the inessential ones. Of course, this is relative. I'm not talking that everybody should be doing the same thing, but relative to your own inclinations, relative to what you want in this world. There you can still make uh, judgments and you can still decide what is good and what is not good for you. Of course, I'm not saying that uh, what is good for you will necessarily be good. What I'm saying is that what you have reasoned about is more likely to be useful than what you have not reasoned about and you are just impulsively doing and may regret later. So at least thinking about it uh, increases the chances that it will be benign. On social media, uh, you will have friends, you will have relatives, and you will think that uh, without social media, you cannot uh, keep those uh, connections. And I think this is not the case. I think this is just a, an excuse. This is a pretext to keep using that dumb thing. Uh, in my case, what I have done is to keep contact with the people I care about, whether it is friends or relatives. 
and uh, I will get a phone call, let's say, from a relative uh, or a friend, and they will be like, hey, how have, you, how have you been? And I'm like, okay, I'm doing great. How about you? Fine. When should we meet? Let's meet. And once we get to meet, we will talk about everything that has transpired since our last meeting. So I don't need to follow the minutia, you know, everything that is happening in your life. I don't need to be tracking your activities to care about you or to love you or whatever. I know that I am positively disposed towards you and we will have the opportunity for a profound experience, for a deep connection when we get to meet, whenever that happens. So for me, it's not that, oh, I will lose my friends, I will lose my family, I will lose everything because I am not on social media. I think this is not the case. And we know this is not the case because we have been social animals since the beginning of time and social media is just a thing that has existed for a couple of decades. We know how to socialize and we know how to do it quite well and we have been doing it for a very long time. We will be okay. On this note, I remember how uh, with my friends back when uh, I was uh, in uh, Greece, when I was still, before I went to university, how we would uh, even have regularity in our meetings. So we would be like, hey, we meet at 9 p.m. at the city square, for example. And we didn't have social media or uh, even uh, phones, and uh, or it was the beginning of having phones or whatever. And we would just know to show up there. And I remember how it was a great thing because we weren't actually limited to our immediate friends. So let's say I would arrange to meet with two other people uh, at the city square, 9 p.m. And I would go there and the others wouldn't show up yet. Well, there are other people there who you, whom you know from school or from football or from this or from that. And now you get to talk with them and socialize with them and you're having a good experience. You don't need to be with those two people the whole time. Otherwise, it's a, it's, it's a make or break kind of situation. And I think this uh, was um, actually good because it builds a character. You get to socialize, you get to adapt to uh, circumstances that are unforeseen, and uh, there is uh, nothing harm that comes out of it. It's not the end of the world if something happens to you and you don't show up. That's fine. We will be with those others instead, and once you show up, you know where to find us. This is the idea. My point is, it doesn't matter exactly how we will go about socializing. My point is that we can do it. We don't need this intermediary, this platform for us to socialize. And I think this platform, instead of being an intermediary for socialization, is actually uh, what is creating uh, controversies, what is creating this kind of... uh, bad behavioral patterns in our milieu. So personally, I don't see anything good in uh, social media. I think the bad things are overwhelming. And for me personally, nothing is good. Not a single thing. For anything that you can think of as remotely positive, you can always find something better. Then, of course, we have other things, which are the political uh, things. Like, uh, why would you be on a platform that is controlled by some billionaire and has a clear agenda in one way or another? Why should you be on a platform that is creating filter bubbles and echo chambers? Because that is good for the algorithm, that, that is good for the advertisers. How does that improve your life? Again, why? Why are you doing it? On the topic of uh, Mastodon, I think it's more of the same. I don't think the problem with social media is an ownership problem. 
Of course, that can be discussed in its own right. The matter of ownership, the fact that we have those excessively rich people while the vast majority of people struggle to make ends meet. That's a, an interesting discussion to be had, but that's not the point right now. The point is that on uh, Mastodon, even though it is decentralized, you have the same patterns uh, with uh, people's behavior. They will still do the whole virtue signaling thing of uh, indicating their support for some cause and uh, liking your content even though they have not actually engaged with it in earnest. We will still see this dehumanization and thus the proliferation of extreme views. Like the kind of hateful stuff you find on social media. I have never listened to anyone say that in person. Like the kind of vitriol, as they say, that you see on those platforms. Like it, it truly brings the worst out of people. And I think it is again because of this dehumanization. Like I... Unless you are dealing with some criminal or whatever who has committed something horrific, but I'm talking about an, you know, a person you disagree with politically. I, I have never seen a case where you would actually uh, spit vitriol uh, in front of that person. It's much more civil. It's much more understanding. There is on the topic of civility. There is, of course, the fact that um, social media is engendering behaviors which are fundamentally anti-democratic, profoundly anti-democratic. It, it is not about whether you agree or disagree with an opinion. The fact that certain opinions can be blocked the fact that certain people can be deplatformed, the fact that everything has to go through a filter, everything that is not uh, illegal, right, has to go through a filter, the fact that one person, the owner of the platform, gets to dictate what is right and what is wrong. All of those are uh, against uh, the freedom of expression. All of those are against the spirit of democracy. Forget about the letter of the law. Think about the spirit of the law, the spirit of the Constitution. Why are we doing it this way? Why do we agree to live in a society where many opinions can be tolerated? Why don't we have like a theocracy or, the, or a technocracy or the equivalent of one view and just live under that. What is it in our history that we have understood and have decided that actually democracy is better than those other options? And what is it in our history that has made us understand the importance of courts, the importance of due process, the importance of the presumption of innocence? Something that we don't see on social media. If you are remotely accused of something, you are uh, deplatformed, you are called names, everybody hates you, and it's a terrible thing. You may lose your job, whatever. Were you actually guilty? Nobody knows, nobody cares. And that is uh, the mob behavior. That is what in other eras, uh, the equivalent of a mob attacking some woman on the ground that she was a whore, even though it was an unsubstantiated claim, or she was a witch or whatever, and killing her on the spot. Oh, you are a witch. And they would throw stones at her. Oh, you are a whore. And they would kill her. And we know better. And that's why we have courts of law. And that's why we have due process. And that's why we have the presumption of innocence. And you may say, oh, but why should this obviously bad person be presumed innocent? Because this is the point of having principles in place. Because if you just uh, decide on the basis of appearances, then why do you need the principles? 
Why do you need the constitution? Why do you need laws? Why do you need everything? Anything? You can just decide on the face of it. Oh, I don't like your attitude. You probably are a bad person. Or whatever, right? It could be on a whimsy. All in all, I think that the essence is that we have to rediscover our humanity. And we have to rediscover our humanity by making these kind of interpersonal connections, by engaging with people in the real world, where they actually are, in cafeterias, in bars, in office spaces. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Wherever they are, we have to have those kinds of connections and we have to remind ourselves that social media and this virtual world is exactly that. It's virtual. And the people we find there are avatars. And maybe they are bots as well. There is that. So we have to know not to pay too much attention to them. And we must also remind ourselves of something else, which is the fact of accountability. Like, it's very easy. It, it costs nothing to you personally to go on social media with a pseudonym and accuse someone of something. It costs you nothing. Or it's very easy for you to say that I support this cause and I uh, signal how virtuous I am because I too am for this cause, whatever that cause may be, right? It's very easy for you because you can do it and then after you post the tweet or whatever, you can resume your life there as if nothing had happened. There is no commitment on your part. There is no sacrifice. There are no repercussions. In other words, there is no accountability whatsoever. And so by keeping all these in mind, we have to take a step back and we have to not pay too much attention to what is happening there and, more importantly, not act on the basis of what is happening there. This is something that we saw, for example, with the riots, the recent riots in the United Kingdom, how violent they were and how they were fueled by the spread of misinformation. But it's not the spread of misinformation per se. It's the fact that people are invested in the thing and have an emotional response to it and dehumanize the other side, whichever the other side is, uh, depending on the specific. So finding the humans, finding the human element, finding the human within, and being intentional in our behavior. This is good for us as individuals. We will be more committed to what we do. We will be more thoughtful. We will be more regimented with the things we choose to do. We won't get distracted. We won't go down pointless um, rabbit holes. And it is also good for our society. We are more thoughtful. We don't uh, objectify people. We don't um, demonize them. And we understand the significance of institutions. We understand the value of our um, political architecture. And where there are uh, mistakes, we want to fix them and not just create some... A uh, fake uh, name and just go and uh, uh, spew hatred. That is not constructive. That will not fix anything. That's all for today, folks. Thank you very much for your attention. Take care and uh, goodbye for now.